Hi, I'm Richard Tang, CEO of Zen Internet. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I have Guy Miller, CEO of MS3. Welcome to our HQ in Rochdale, Guy. Morning, Richard. Really good to be here. Thank you. Looking Alt forward net. to it. Now, MS3 is an alt-net with a difference. Uh, in that, your market is mainly Hull. Hull is where you, 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 you grew up. Um, and the, the UK, I just find it very odd. You've got the whole of the UK... And then you've got this little island, which is Hull, that's got a completely different telecoms yeah. regime. So tell me a bit about the whole Hull story and why did you pick Hull as your target market? Look, I, I think all the other alt nets are focusing on yeah. this market. You're on this bit. And look, it is, it is that uniqueness that attracted me and attracted our investors into the area. So if I give a very quick history lesson on this one, you have to literally go back 130 years where we had um, the National Telephone Company running um, most of the exchanges uh, around the country, kind of independently, non-very connected. And then at the turn of the 20th century, um, the government at the time decided this was probably best put under public ownership. So they arranged for all of those companies, the license expired for NTC, and all of the organisations came together under one common ownership owned by the government. Um, and that made a lot of sense, and, and that was the GPO, the General Post Office, the Post Office, British Telecom Openreach, um, over the next 100 years. But one council said, actually, we quite like running a telephone company, can we do it? And the government said, well, no, that's crazy, but I'll tell you what, if you go and find a couple of hundred thousand pounds back in 1910 or whenever this was, um, you can own the license, you can buy the NTC assets and you can own it. And that's what happened. So Hull ended up as if it was an island, a kind of similar regime to Guernsey or the Isle of Man, in that it had its own telephone company. And people know this from the white telephone boxes. And that was the Hull Corporation, council owned, which became Kingston Communications, which became KCOM as we know it today. And for that 100 years, 120 years, it kind of stayed as a monopoly in a mini island. Now, I think the story for the first 100 years is, is a pretty good one, and one you'll probably like, which is it, it owned by the local council, with the local council having you know, things like vetoes over pricing to uh, its residents, and actually a quite a success story. It branched out of there, it floated the business during the dot-com boom, shares in KCOM were £15. Pounds. Unfortunately, dot-com crash happened, shares in KCOM were 50p, and the council sold off its stake. And then what kind of inevitably happens when you have a monopoly and a utility and a capitalist society, you end up with you know, one inevitable outcome, which is that prices go up and service quality goes down. Yeah. And so I think for 100 odd years, it was an extraordinary business for the people of Hull. However, time has changed. And since the council um, sold all their shares in 2007, it's been a very different business. And we saw that as an amazing opportunity. Our founder, 13, 14 years ago, was running a, a marketing business in Hull. He went to go and get a quote for business broadband. He got one quote, it's really expensive. He went to get a second quote and couldn't. And he thought, actually, don't need to do marketing anymore. I should start a competing business ISP. So he managed to raise about £5 million, started building a network. And that network was really successful. And it was used by some of the big corporations in Hull. It was used by some of the big carriers as the only other point into Hull. And then for the next 10 years, they built that up. But that kind of dream of always wanting to um, offer choice, always wanting to be different, always wanted to be residential, but it wasn't until 2019, sorry, 2021 when I joined the business that we were able to raise serious amounts of money needed to build a residential fibre network, that we took that dream, that long-standing dream of 10 plus years to real fruition and have now built out two thirds of Hull um, against the incumbent. Wow. So, so, I mean, the competitive marketplace, completely different, I guess, all compared. C completely with... different. So... KCOM is you know, the wholesale, dominant in wholesale, the dominant in retail. They don't really have any wholesale partners. I mean, they have them, but in terms of scale, it's a small fraction of their network. And so what we wanted to do, my, my background has always been wholesale, from running wholesale voice businesses to working in the wholesale division of uh, Talk Talk, as it was at the time. And I wanted to create a wholesale-only operation in Hull. So actually what we were able to do is build a network and then open it up much like Open Reach or City Fibre, so that any partner could come on board and finally enter that whole market for the first time since broadband was invented with genuine competitive wholesale prices and a kind of wholesale first approach. So the difference is our partners 
they have one, they have competition with KCOM, clearly, as the incumbent, but otherwise everyone else is using our network. And the great thing for the people of Hull, who for years were paying you know, more than they should have done, is that they now can choose for, from 10, 15, 20 providers. The great thing for me and our business is, of those 20 providers, one is KCOM, 19 are our network. So we've got a great opportunity to really fill up Hull with value uh, services that kind of put the customer at the heart of all of this. And I think importantly, having it wholesale only, have no retail competition from us, having a fixed price for everyone means that you create that level playing field forever. We don't create a duopoly here. We create a genuine wholesale open environment for anyone to enter and bring Hull back to the UK average for broadband prices. So, so you, re, you know, MS3 has really opened up free market competition effectively in yeah. what was otherwise a monopoly. I yeah, guess. I mean, a hundred percent. You know, look, I mean, KCOM did. Oh, that's great. It, <laughs> KCOM did offer wholesale, right? It, you know, yes, it was, well, it was regulated. It, it was had regulated to. to it absolutely had to. So I'm not saying they didn't, but what I will say is that providers find it easier to come onto our network yeah. than they did to come onto KCOM's network. And that absolutely has opened up the market. Ofcom, when they did the last market review three years ago now, you know, their conclusion was that people of Hull pay more than anywhere else in the UK for broadband. Yeah. And Hull is not a super wealthy city, right? There's a lot of mm -hmm. urban deprivation. But the average person, the average family in Hull was paying around £15 a month more for broadband than anywhere else in the country. Oh, wow. Yes. So more than, you know, £15 a month, more than the millionaires who live in Mayfair, more than the people who live on a remote Scottish island, right? It was mm -hmm. fundamentally unfair. It was like a broadband tax for living in Hull. And now since we've come to the market and absolutely flooded the city, um, it is probably the most competitive place to buy broadband as it stands today, which is just fantastic, right? Um, our investors, we're part of an Article 8 fund, um, and that means we have kind of ES3 tracking that we need to do. And one of the key thing, metrics that we report on is how much money we're putting back into the pockets of people of Hull. And we always talk, when I talk to my team, this isn't about people wanting to save money on broadband. This is families who need to save money on broadband. Um, you know, the list price of a, a one gig service in Hull before we arrived was 70 pounds, 75 if you're out of contract, a month. Um, and now, you know, our partners are out there at significantly less than half of that, which is fantastic in terms of democratizing the market, bringing competition and bringing people online who had opted out because the pricing was too high. Mm. Well, that wholesale only uh, route, Tell me a bit about that because most altnets end up having a retail ISP and they've got to have a retail ISP because it's of this chicken and egg situation. They've not built the network yet, so they're not going to attract any wholesale customers. So they've got to have a retail ISP mm. whilst they build the network. Then once they get to a network to a sufficient scale, you can start attracting those wholesale customers. And the only exception is if like, for example, City Fiber or Freedom Fiber, you've got an anchor ISP, maybe an, an investor into the business. So how did you crack that chicken yeah. and egg situation? Yeah. Um, so there's three big differences that we have that you, you have, otherwise you're absolutely right. There's nothing more frustrating than building 100,000 homes and finding no customers because <laughs> no one's ready to join until you've got to 200,000. So three key differentiators for us. So number one, it, it's Hull, right? People want to go to Hull. It's a different market. You know, if you're knocking on a door and the door you're knocking on is probably paying 50 or 60 pounds for their broadband, it's quite easy to make a sale. So we were able to attract people earlier than if they would have gone in more traditional areas against Virgin, against Open Reach partners. Um, secondly is the history there was 10 years of history there and 10 years of hard work before i joined the business that meant you know we supply all the 5g masks for one of the nationwide brands um we do you know police contracts etc there's real history there of credibility which again is harder for some of the newer alternates to to have and thirdly is to be honest a little bit of a black little black book you know having worked in wholesale for many years myself we were able to get people probably a bit more interested early on than maybe naturally they would have um, and then we did some really creative commercial deals so we actually approached businesses you know uh, b2b businesses and said well if we help fund you will you start up a consumer brand so actually we were very creative commercially to get people going and it's something that we always pride ourselves in is being commercially ahead of the game when it comes to wholesale um, which you'll hear about later I'm sure but um, in terms of being able to offer things that make the reseller 
feel added value of coming through us. And this isn't tick box added value. This is real things, right? Mm -hmm. Going back to my history in my 20s when I ran resellers, I know what it, I really wanted from a wholesaler. Yeah. And I know what they thought they wanted to give. And they were quite often different. And we've taken a very different approach to that. Yeah, because you managed to get Talk Talk on. When I look, I went to your website yeah. and I did a postcode check in Hull and it comes up with 14 different residential yes. providers that I can sign up with. Um, a lot that I'd not heard of, a lot of that are very, you know, exclusively hall based. Absolutely. And then there's Talk Talk. Yeah. Um, so I guess you used to be at Talk Talk. So yeah. I guess you had some names in your black book yeah. there. So uh, possibly, to be really clear, that Talk Talk there is actually through Home Telecom, who use Talk I Talk's see. brand. So this is Telecom's Acquisitions Limited, yeah. which Talk Talk's the major shareholder in. So they sell under the Talk Talk brand onto our network. The actual formal arrangement with Talk Talk will hopefully come yeah. um, but we have it via that brand there so I it's see. kind of brand identity side of things but you're absolutely right we have been very good at attracting partners we have something like 50 or 60 signed up um, probably you know almost too many you know now we actually need to really work on the partners who are going to drive significant volumes and really understand how because to your point it's a, it's a different market people don't think to go to the price comparison sites to buy broadband because they've never had a choice. And if people have never had a choice and never known how to switch, you've got a real education piece to get people to do it. And, you know, as much as we talked about KCOM's pricing being high, the product's brilliant, right? You know, they were the first um, kind of city to bring ADSL to the UK, possibly even Europe, first city to finish full fibre, right? There's no product advantage here. This is about running an efficient business that provides consumer choice that drives pricing down whilst retaining that product advantage. So again, it's a very different sell to everywhere else, but for our partners, works really well. Yeah, and in fact, you made your own price comparison website. So on your website, yeah, we would you say... We were, you can buy from all these different... Yeah, we were, the, we were the first to do this. So we were trying to work out... We were spending marketing money on our network, but kind of what, what, what does MS3 mean to the residents of Hull? Well, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it means digging holes in streets, right? So how do we separate that out when they can't buy from us? But we were having huge traffic coming to our website just to see what was going on. So, yeah, we built a full price comparison site. We are the first one to do that um, in the UK, as far as I know. And, when they, and then we built a full integration journey. So actually, not only is it a price comparison site, but the end customers can place orders via our website on each of our partners with their own terms and conditions, with their own of that, even their own direct debit details processed securely via our website. So our partners didn't even need to have brilliant web journeys. We were doing loads for them to help generate their sales and make sure that any kind of interest was turning into conversion. Bizarrely, our marketing department probably spends two thirds of their life helping our partners marketing out to make them more efficient because there's nothing that winds us up more than a lead comes through our network through some word of mouth, comes to our website, goes to a partner and disappears. Yes. You know, so the more we can do to help close those journeys, the better for it. Yeah, yeah interesting stuff. And, and in terms of wholesale, um, are all these partners, these 50 or 60 partners, are they layer two or layer three? So I guess, are, do they have their yeah. own networks? Or are you effectively doing the layer three stuff for yeah. them and offering them a white label service? It sounds like including collecting the initial payment or the yeah. direct debit. So, so I had a utopia when we started that we were going to have a, a layer two business and my business was renting glass. Right? Yeah. That's all I was going to do. Rent glass to highly educated um, ISPs who knew what they were doing. The reality to your kind of chicken and egg point was not quite that. So we had to quite early on realize that holding out for those layer two partners um, was going to mean we had a lot of empty network. So we did launch a layer three service, which has effectively got us over the first couple of years. Our aspiration is to move to a layer two only service right. and get back to that real pure um, product, which is renting glass, either one gig or 10 gig, you know, and nothing else. That's what I really think that's what the industry needs when it gets to it but the maturity of the customer base is not always there to do it and sometimes they need a bit of hand holding but yeah i would love a business that does 
you know, an incredibly lean business, layer two only. We have a pop in our own head office, which is the second pop into Hull after KCOM's network. So it's all there and we have other pops in London and Manchester and, and around the corner. Um, and just to have the partners who connect to that and do everything else themselves is, is a dream. And we will get there yeah, yeah. Um, in the next year or so. And what we'd probably like to do is move some of those layer three partners onto the layer two service of someone else's over time. I firmly believe, do what you're brilliant at, right? And that's build the network. The actual ISP management, the customer management, those kind of things are better done by ISPs who've been doing it a long time and know how to manage that. Yeah, well, MS3 and Zen are having a chat. We are. Um, and we're, we definitely want layer two, uh, if we do anything. That's good, that's good. And So of the 50 or 60, do you have any layer two partners yet, or are they all layer three at the moment? Uh, no, I think it's probably, um, of the kind of top 10 that sell, it's probably 50-50. Right, okay. Something like that. Okay. So yeah, it, over time it, it matures yeah. and you get a, a different type of partner. Obviously, they get a price advantage on layer two. Yes. But you have to spend some money building some network assets realistically. Yeah. But I guess that means that you do have a lot of the overheads and challenges of running a, an ISP, but all yeah. white label I mean, ISP, look, we, one touch switching, for example. So, so, so our demarcation is the ONT. So even okay. if we're providing layer three services, we are not providing a managed router. Um, we don't go as far as that. We are literally providing the IP address and transit, really. Yeah. So it's that, it's that interface there. So for one-touch switching, it's unfortunately had to break some of our lovely journeys yeah. because previously we were doing that um, complete journey for some of our partners and taking the orders. Yeah. But actually, one-touch switching doesn't allow that. So one-touch switching means the order has to come from the ISP. And therefore, we do have to bounce out of our order journey to the partners to place the order so they can do the one-touch switch. Yeah. So what we do is kind of educate and help and encourage partners on one-touch switching. But as a pure wholesaler, we're not actually accountable for it in any way, other than if we don't help our partners, we'd get lower volumes and possible complaints against them, against them which isn't going to help us. Yeah. So in terms of your footprint, yep. I understand you've got, what, 200,000? Yeah, a bit over 200,000 homes passed now. Yeah. Um, about 130,000 of those are in Hull. Okay. So that is our real sweet spot. And when we say Hull, we mean kind of the, the what was called the KCOM original licensed area. So it's, yes. it's where KCOM are there. And then we have got a build of about 80,000 via very traditional PIA um, in Scunthorpe, Grimsby, Immingham, and uh, Mexborough. So we've pretty much finished the entire of Scunthorpe. Scunthorpe. We've stopped building there now at about 98% covered. We like to do a full contiguous build. And we've done about half of Grimsby, finished Immingham, and have moved across more this direction towards places like Mexborough and Conisborough and things like that as well. But our, we, we, the, the challenge we have is that our partners do so well selling in Hull to actually convince them to put the efforts into the PIA footprint when yeah. you're competing against Virgin and Sky and Vodafone and TalkTalk Talk is, is a slightly bigger challenge. So we like to maximise what we're doing really well, and that is Hull. And, and is it more or less expensive to build in Scunthorpe? compared with much cheaper yeah so oh it's much cheaper then. yeah so, so obviously the main problem we have richard is that whilst again kcom, KCOM have obligations similar to open reach they've not had to productize pia so um, they have sharing obligations but no product and no set pricing um so historically we filed sharing requests of of that passive network using ati access to infrastructure regulations but really struggled to get anywhere with it um, and it's only been this year that with a bit of support from Ofcom and some local MPs following some concerned residents, et cetera, that we've been able to get some access to their network. And literally that trial started this week, right? So we've got right. some access. But until then, 110,000 homes, 100% our own network, pretty much half dug. So literally dug, digging 700 kilometers of paths around Hull. Okay. And then having put up a number of thousand telegraph poles as well to provide the network. So we've had to recreate a brand new network from scratch in an urban environment with absolutely no use of the incumbent's um, uh, passive infrastructure. That's been very, very challenging. Whereas in Scunthorpe, I just follow the PIA rule book on open reach, build a network and you know, here's some money and two months later get it handed over. Yeah. It's a very different world when you're doing that. So everything is permit driven, everything is working with the councils, working with the communities. Um, it creates a lot of awareness because when you disruption does create awareness. So ironically, we see far higher take up quicker because of the um, awareness compared with PIA. But from a build and a people challenge, it's been really, really dramatic. But what we do have now is our own network. So no rentals. 
you're not paying open reach equivalent any PIA rentals for an empty network. So economically, you know, after all the hard work, it puts us in a pretty good place of a of our own network infrastructure. Interesting, because I mean, the feedback I've had on PIA from a number of alt nets is yeah. it worked pretty well. It's all right, very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we never like to admit that, right, in our industry, because <laughs> no one wants to give OpenReach too much credit oh, credibility. Yeah. But, you know, this all started, you know, 12, 13 years ago. Yeah. Um, and where Hull is now is where PIA was 13 years ago. Yeah. So there's no systems, you know, it's spreadsheets yeah, and yeah. whereabouts on a, on, a, on a Excel form that goes backwards and forwards. So we're, we're starting very late to the party. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, we've used a very small amount of OpenReach Duck. We use council ducks. We use anyone else who's got anything to share. We'll use it. City Fiber have a small network in Hull. Um, but otherwise, yeah, we've had to build it all ourselves, which has not been easy. But I'm glad we did the long run. Yeah. So, so interesting feedback that although KCOM has a regulatory obligation to share its infrastructure, actually doing it in practice has been excruciatingly hard. Yeah, and, look, and it was with OpenReach in the early days, right? Yes, it was. And it I, was. I don't want it to, was. I don't blame KCOM here in any in any way, right? You know, if we're the mm. first people to seriously ask for it, yeah. you know, OpenReach was being pestered left, right and centre for it, and the regulator stepped in and, and helped sort it out over many years. Yes. Um, you know, if, if we're the only ones who want to use KCOMs, it's, it's not surprising that they haven't fully productized it, digitalized it, just sitting around ready for someone else to use their network. So, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be fair to them, this is far more circumstances than it is any kind of tactic. But, you know, we're only starting to, to get some access now. And yeah. hopefully what that will do is those areas that we can't economically build to. So we're talking the villages and things in outside of Hull in the original licensed area, we will hopefully now get to those because they were off our plan before because we just couldn't economically recreate a network next to them, underground or overhead. But now with access to theirs over the next couple of years, it'll be a slow build, but hopefully we'll get there and we can do full coverage and there won't be anyone left in that yeah. Hull area who doesn't have a choice anymore. Yeah. So the 130,000 that you've built in Hull, is, is that the extent of your whole build? Or you oh, it's about 160,000 in total. And then there's probably another 50,000 ac across, you know, I mean, Hull is, a, is the city. You then have Beverly, Cottingham, and then yeah. it's villages. Um, yeah. So it's about 210,000 full footprint. Um, if you include every single... This is the whole licensed area. The original licensed yeah, area. But absolutely. that would include farms and things, right, you know, which we may not commercially go to. Um, but we want to cover 99%. It's our aspiration. Yeah. I think it's the right thing to do as well. I think it would kill me to see that we'd covered, you know, 99% of people were saving money and 1% were still having to make that choice. One thing that was what I always found fascinating was, despite being the first city to have full fibre, it had the lowest fixed line take up in the country. Right. So that kind of argument of full fibre drives fundamental change for good um, falls apart if it's too expensive. Mm. And so around the rest of the country, I think the last stats I saw is about 87% take a fixed line product. Before we came to Hull, it was 79 in Hull. So that meant, you know, that kind of gap. You say there's 13 people who just opt out. Maybe they're happy with their mobile. They're happy with I don't know, whatever else service they've got. And maybe some are just, you know, completely offline. But that meant there was probably about 10% of people there making a choice. Mm. They actually said, I can't afford to have broadband in my house. And when you looked at those and kind of work out how many of those are you know, families with kids, kids at school, mm -hmm. you know, especially during previous, you know, kind of COVID times and offline learning. Um, there was a huge, you know, number of people, 10,000 plus families were opting out due to pricing. And that's what I'm most excited about getting back online. Those people that are now going to have those life choices. We all know how much, you know, money you save in online shopping if you can shop online. Yeah. Your average job that you take if you found it online has something like a 12% uplift in salary compared with just finding it locally. And your life choice chances for kids going through school who can do research online and work on Microsoft mm -hmm. Teams is significantly higher. And I think that's the good that we bring to all of this, right? We save loads of people money who need us to, need to save money. But actually, we're going to bring people online who, who were forced offline through pricing before, and that's pretty fantastic. Mm. So y your build aspiration, I believe, is a, a little over half a million yep. as, as the end state. And, and I guess that would mean that you're going to go from being most, you know, majority of your customers in Hull, now two-thirds of your footprint are, is in Hull, 
to actually Hull being the minority of a much bigger footprint, going from having what sounds like much less competition in Hull yeah. to much more competition against mm. Open Reach's ferocious build and all the other alt nets yeah. that are clambering p for position. So it'd be interesting to sort of hear, first of all, about y y your end goal, that mm. half a million, and your thoughts about shifting the business from being Hull centric to Hull being potentially actually the, the smaller part of what yeah. you do. So it's a really interesting point. And look, you, you set those aspirations at the start of your build, right? And I think when everyone set those aspirations, you probably didn't realize there was going to be 100 builders, right? And I think you have, you, have, you have to review that at the time. And, you know, much like other interviewers you've had on here, it may be easier to buy than build those, okay. those right? We'd, lo we'd yeah. love to get to that. We see Hull as, as a hook, right? So we were able to sell in Scunthorpe with decent size ISPs quicker than others because of Hull. So Hull was the hook that got people to the network, yeah. got people excited about MS3, got them spending money with us. Once you were on with us, well, you just add your Scunthorpe RFS data to your database, and then if someone places an order, it ends up with us. So actually, I, I think f firmly that hook and that purpose still exists. But what you're doing is bringing partners to the area that wouldn't come so quickly, who can then sell everywhere else. Yeah. So I still think, even if Hull was a smaller part of our build, it is our heritage. 85% of our staff live in HU postcodes. And, you know, I think you have to absolutely hang on to something you're, you know, you're really striving to achieve. Outside of Hull, we tend to sell on product, right? It's a better product. But in Hull, it's on, on value and the, and the savings to people. So I, I think it will change a little bit. But look, this is a proud Hull business. We can see the Humber Bridge from our office. We're not moving from there. It's also our main data center. And therefore, actually, I think, you know, you can retain that heritage and that pride in why you existed whilst just offering a competing service to everyone else, right? Yeah. You know, Zen is a fantastic Rochdale-based business. It doesn't mean you don't sell around the country and as soon as you start selling in Scotland, you're not proud about being from Rochdale anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So I think absolutely those values stick with you no matter what you do. And wherever we end up building or whoever we end up doing deals with, that value proposition is really important to us. And the half million aspiration, is is that still the goal or, well, I think, or is that one of the early goals that you're like, mm, maybe we need to stay? No, we, I mean, we weren't one of the ones who went out and stuck a three million target with nothing on yeah, the yeah. So we set a realistic target that we business planned from. Do we, uh, do we think that going out and building another 300,000 from scratch now would be a great idea in the current economic climate? No. Would it be a okay. better idea to acquire it? You know, we, we do pretty well in terms of penetration. We're one of the few debt-free alt-nets. We're very lucky that wow. our investors have put all the money in as equity. Right, right. You know, so, so we are debt-free, and therefore we're in a pretty good financial place. You know, we talk a lot about alt-nets that will be EBITDA positive soon, and we will be um, in the next few months. But actually, I think we'll be the first cash flow positive alt-net, which will be in less than 12 months, i.e. Okay. our revenues will be sustaining installations and all of that without borrowing a penny. So we're in a good financial position, and therefore, when the kind of great consolidation comes about, we, we've got a strong purpose and a strong way of, of, of generating expanse there. And the great thing about a wholesale customer base, especially ones with national brands, is that bolt-ons are actually relatively straightforward because you're not bolting two retailers together with the complexity there. We're just adding someone else's 100,000 footprint onto our database yeah. with our fully integrated partners via the same APIs and the same service stack, right? Yeah. So actually I think, and, and then we bring a huge route to market that they don't have. You know, even the ones that say they're wholesale, you know, don't have the customers, don't have the experience. Yeah. You'll know that when you want to go wholesale, it's not as easy as saying, we want to go wholesale. You know, every system needs to change. Every, um, the, the way that the team think about things has to change. Mm -hmm. When you're wholesale from day one, and you build your systems from day one for wholesale, it makes life so much easier. Mm. And so what we were able to do is design a business with a fair pricing structure that we've stuck to, with systems that are meant for wholesale, with a model that means everyone understands the partner needs first and then the end customers, which means for us, bolt-ons will be much easier. So I think, look, we'll, we will get bigger, um, whether it's organic or inorganic, watch this space, I guess, Richard. Okay. Okay. It's a busy time in the market, right? It, it, is, it is indeed. So, so the two markets, let's, let's look at Hull and Scunthorpe. Hull, more expensive build, less competition. Scunthorpe, cheaper to build, yep. more competition. Yep. Which is most profitable? Hull. Hull, okay. 
Twice the price to build, three times the penetration. Fantastic. Simple maths. Yeah. And how many customers have you got now? About 15,000 now since okay. we um, started building residential about two and a half years ago. Okay. So we're pretty happy with that. Right. So, so in terms of market penetration with a 200k footprint, you're still at seven and seven, seven and a half percent. Yeah. So obviously we do split the two very separately um, yeah. and we do the kind of classic cohorts thing, as you can imagine. So in, in Hull, anything that's more than two years old now, so anything between two and three years old, because we haven't been building for three years, um, is circa 20, no, circa 29%. Oh, that's so, so we see huge, yeah, that's really good. Hu huge there. Uh, I wish Gunthorpe was quite the same, but it's taking a bit longer to to carve up, mainly because our partners get very excited about Hull, and we have to constantly push them the other way um, okay. to do that. But it's understandable, right? But no, across the across the network, it's we're we're in a happy place with penetration. Okay, where will the industry be in twenty thirty after the big consolidation? Where do you think it will be? And, right. and I guess very specifically, where will MS three fit yeah. in that jigsaw puzzle? No, I think we all have to recognise we're all building the third network, right? That doesn't mean the third network will be owned by one person or two person or three companies, but we're all building that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's a complete misnomer in the industry that you know, people set out with these aspirational targets and they're not, not, not hitting them and, and, and therefore is a real problem. The fact is there's so many of us doing it that actually we've just got to the build totals far quicker than anyone thought we would you know the alt nets are combined 12 14 million now and, and we just got there by doing it with 50 different companies rather than probably you know five would have made more sense but that's not how it works so look at some point that th that third network is what is driving innovation that third network is what is driving competition it's that third network that made open reach pull the finger out it's that third network that made virgin panic and create next fiber Mm -hmm. it's, it's that third network yeah. that's allowing Ofcom to you know, consider its options and, and potentially deregulate further. So, so amongst all of us, whether together formally or not, we are the third network pushing things forward. And I kind of think the ownership point on that is actually not the most important one. Because I believe actually it's creating the third network, making it sustainable, making it wholesale, making it competitive. That's what's going to make the country better mm. and never return us back to the duopoly state we were in. Whoever owns it, it really doesn't matter to me as such because right. it should be the third one that fundamentally creates choice forevermore. You know, whether it's the kind of Iliad equivalent in France, or whatever, right? It's that challenger there. And just because it's a bit messy at the moment, with quite a few owners and quite a few CEOs and quite a few build techniques, just think of it ending up as a third network that is the challenger forever. Um, and that's why it's so important to protect. And it's so important to protect all parts of that, mm -hmm. make sure that people are supported, are funded, um, that we don't get carried away with you know, listening to bad news when there's plenty of good news to talk about. Yeah. You know, that we spend far less time in our industry at the moment. We spend too much time talking about one small alt-net who hasn't done very well failing than we do about the fact that mm. BT Group are going to have well over half a million you know, net losses mm. um, this year going to, to alt-nets, right? That's where we should be having the conversation. And so I think, yeah, great consolidation, looking forward to it. It almost doesn't matter the outcome to me, whether it's three, four, whatever, as long as it's a third network that stays forever and, draw and forces the others into fairness and technology upgrades and value forevermore. Yeah, I mean, but do you think it, do you think it will end up with a one consolidation? Oh yeah, the answer is three. But but that's not the point. No, you'll, you'll end up with a few rural ones. I think there'll be a rural um, yeah, super builder okay. and an urban one. I think just fundamentally, when you start doing the numbers behind the scenes with investment models, it's very hard to mix a rural builder and a urban builder together, yeah. especially if you have a wholesale price because a wholesale price is set on an urban build strategy and urban build costs. If a rural builder has spent five years at £1,500 a home past, it, the two can never work together. So I think, yeah, we'll have a conglomerate of rural builders um, and then we'll have a conglomerate of urban builders. Yeah. And then pockets of kind of interesting ones. Yeah. You know, I, I know Tom was on here recently from Barn and, and, and they will stay independent and they'll do their thing. And who I knows, so. right? If you're talking about islands in telecoms we've just talked about how it's the original island yeah, yeah. in the uk telecoms maybe that means ms3 can sustain itself in the future as an island yeah. as a true competitive option we're already the largest we have the most wholesale lines in hull mm -hmm. so why can't we stay kcom stayed independent for 120 years so who knows where it goes Richard? who knows uh, and what about those rural 
what about BD UK? Because um, I mean, around Hull, there are some pretty small villages that you yeah. imagine would be eligible for a bit of BD UK funding. Is that of interest yeah. to you? We, we like to keep, I, I'm, I'm a very simple man. So when I said earlier, I want to rent glass, that's literally okay. what I want the business to be. Okay. So, so government subsidy is for people who are great at government subsidy. Right. We would only be good at it if we okay. did it. And okay. there's others that are great. So in our area, someone like Quickline does a fantastic job of, of soaking up that subsidy and commercially building and offering multiple technology types. Yeah. I have no desire to go and do a slightly worse job than someone else to gain a bit of subsidy. Okay. Um, a lot of the subsidy money that's gone recently is people who whose investors are having less confidence in giving them equity. Yeah. And therefore, BDUK is also a good way to continue yeah. to build. Okay. Again, we're not in that unfortunate position. We're fully backed and therefore, we just focus on, we do really well, yeah. which is urban building in Hull and surrounding towns. Last question. I believe you've had a spot of bother with telegraph poles, particularly in Hedden. <laughs> What's all that about? What's your side of the story? My favourite topic, yeah, yeah. telegraph poles. Anyone who probably watches this video will know I talk about this far too often. Yeah, look, as we alluded to earlier, building, uh, share, sharing infrastructure in Hull hasn't been possible. So we have had to, to build telegraph poles. Really simple economic model. If the houses are close together, we can dig it. If they're further apart, we have to go aerial because it or leave it behind. Right? And that's the choice we have. Um, and we fundamentally feel that leaving it behind is taking out a number of people's life choices when it comes to broadband. So we're not going to do it. So we've had to put telegraph poles in and they are not always loved by residents. There are certain parts of the community that feel um, that they're not useful, that they're not wanted. And so we have had challenges in the past, right? And it's gone from the, the ludicrous, you know, people, councillors standing in holes trying to stop us doing things to the, to the downright, you know, dangerous and, and, and having things chopped down, right? And the, oh, really? You yeah, yeah. And, and actually, down. yeah, and we, you know, police called a number of times. So whilst it can be, sometimes you just think, yeah, this is um, a very small group of people, a minority who are causing this. Actually, it, it can be really worrying. And I think for our, for our team and our staff, that's where I feel the worst about this because, you know, you sell this vision of the good we're bringing to the area. I tell every single person who joins our business on the day I meet them, which is normally their day two, that think of your work as saving families £150 every time and think of it as um, what they're going to do with that money. So if your KPI is, I don't know, um, installing six homes in a day if you're an installer, don't think the KPI is a meaningless number, mm -hmm. but you've saved 900, those families £900 um, a year. What are they going to do with it? And in Hull, it genuinely could be the difference of whether their kids went back to school with new school uniform or not last month. It could be the difference whether they turn the heating on at 17 or 16 degrees. Um, and I tell everyone in our business to think, never think in KPIs, think about converting that to how much money we're saving the people of Hull who need it most. And therefore, it's really frustrating when a very small group of people who are happy to pay more but not have a telegraph pole, um, kind of get in the way of that. And especially for my team, who are so obsessed around saving the people who need it most money and I'm offering an amazing service, to then be dragged through the mud for something as, as, as minor as a telegraph pole is frustrating, right? Because you see it on the faces of your team who are like, oh, you know, querying, am I doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. And we are, you know. We do have a hardcore group of a couple of dozen protesters who write to me frequently and I write back and we have interesting conversations. But we also have 15,000 families who have moved to our service. Half are using telegraph poles um, to connect and they are grateful we're there. And that's what we've got to remember, right? But look, you know, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs and it just turns out that... Um, Telegraph poles are my omelettes. <laughs> there you go. Telegraph poles are your omelettes. Well, look, Guy, that's been a really, really interesting insight, particularly into the different challenges of competing in Hull. Thank you very much for joining me on my uh, channel. Thank you very much, Richard. Great to do it today. And uh, thank you very much for watching. See you again next time.